The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Plein Air and Fine Art Connoisseur Magazines. Want to learn how to paint landscapes with a limited palette? I think you'll enjoy this video with John Potoshnik. Hi, I'm John Potoshnik. Uh, if you're viewing this video, I certainly appreciate that. If you have invested in it, I particularly thank you for that. My intention of this video is to show you my painting strategy from start to finish. I'll take you through all the preliminary work I do, even the reason I select a, a particular subject. Uh, assembling all the reference material, I think about the concept, since that's a really important part of what we do as painters. Uh, from there, I'll, uh, we'll talk about the composition, the drawing, the value structure of a painting, even the palette selected and why that a particular palette is selected. We'll talk about technique. And even I'll mention framing at the end, even the importance of framing, because it's the presentation. I've been teaching workshops for a long time. My intention for this video is to, is to really help you, um, encourage you to put into practice some of the things that I do. I found them helpful for me. It's not the only way of working, but, um, and probably some of the reason I work the way I do is because of my temperament, personality, all that stuff. But um, I found uh, teaching art students for many, many years that uh, when I teach them the principles that I'm going to be teaching on this video, that they have found it really helpful and it has, uh, in many cases, revolutionized their work. The important thing, of course, is that um, you take some of the things that I'm doing, things that I've learned, and actually apply them. Uh, it's one thing sitting and watching a video. It's a totally another thing to pick up the brush and apply some of these principles learned. And we learn from a lot of different people. This is one way of working, and it's a way that I feel comfortable. Uh, I try to separate out uh, as many things as I can. For instance, I'll, I'm going to begin this, uh, this demonstration with a monochromatic block in. I find that really helpful for me because it separates the value from the color. And so just by doing that for me, I can establish the, the, the value structure, the composition, the concept is all settled in right there, but I haven't had to deal with color, so it, it's much easier to manipulate uh, value than have to mani manipulate both value and color. So I found, I found that really helpful. And um, it also, what it really does for me, I think you'll find the same for you, that it uh, improves my, increases my confidence before starting into full color. So I'll, by the time I have a value uh, monochromatic block in, done, I feel pretty confident of the direction that the painting's going to take. And it's, I can stand back and analyze it, uh, rub things out, change whatever is necessary to uh, bring that uh, monochromatic uh, block into the place that I feel, okay, I'm ready to begin with the color. I put quite a bit of, um, of effort into preliminary work. I don't always do it exactly the same all the time. 
Uh, sometimes it depends on the complexity of the piece. Uh, you know, a major painting that's quite large, and particularly you'll notice if you followed my work at all, I, I have a lot of architecture in my paintings. And so there's, uh, sometimes it's quite complex. And when a painting is complex, that's when I spend a lot more time on the front end. I may start, uh, I usually start with some sort of sketch, whether it's a, a pencil sketch or a color, little color sketch, a value study, any number of those things I'll use to uh, help inform the, uh, the piece that's, you know, the final piece, the larger piece that's on the easel. Uh, one of the things that um, I found really helpful, this, this uh, demonstration piece that I'm going to do for you all, this is just with a felt tip marker, and I wanted to lay it out and, and just establish a value structure and a composition. I wanted to show you, so this is in felt tip, and it's really small, it's only four and a half inches square, but over here, this is how all this started, and these were some photos, reference photos that I took years ago of an old farmhouse in the, in, uh, the Midwest, in Kansas, as, uh, as a matter of fact. And um, you can see then the reference is pretty small. So what I did for, the, uh, for this demonstration is I took a digital photograph of these and enlarged them to these uh, larger images here, the 8x10s, so that I can see a little more information. But this is how it, the, the scene started right here. This is, the, this is the full scene of it. And then I, I wanted to do a square composition. The question may be, why, why square landscapes are primarily uh, horizontal, which is true. But uh, I think doing something different with a landscape and not always a horizontal, uh, I like the challenge of, of trying to communicate a landscape and an interesting composition into a square format. So that's one of the reasons I chose square for this one. But these photos here, um, I began with that, and then because I wanted square, I cropped it to what I thought was an interesting composition. Yeah, and then it was gridded. So over here, you'll see the grid marks. This helps me to uh, lay it out on, onto the canvas here. And you'll see also I've made some marks here, which are my grid, and we'll talk about those as, as we proceed. So my reference began here. I shot a detail uh, shot also up close so I'd have a little more information. But uh, this is how it all started. Why does this inspire me? It's because these are the kinds of things I like. I paint a lot of uh, farm scenes, small town America scenes, uh, country, farmhouses, that whole thing just uh, is a great inspiration to me. So what I want to stress to you all is when, you, when you're even selecting your subject matter and deciding what you want to paint, paint your passion. It's just, uh, if, if you're painting something you love, you're, you're, uh, you're going to be enthusiastic when you do that painting. You're going to be, um, it's going to, what's inside of you is going to flow out onto the canvas. So I would encourage you first to paint what you love to paint, what you understand. And um, a lot of times I find, um, oh, I've done this myself many times. You'll be in the car and you'll be driving and you'll shoot a, um, a picture of it. You'll jump out of the car, snap a picture, and be on your way. Well, that makes it somewhat difficult um, in really communicating what you captured and why you took that photograph. So when you begin a painting, it's important that if you're going back and looking at your reference photos that you think, why did I stop to shoot that photo? And as we all know, photos don't necessarily pick up all the great things that we, uh, the, they don't pick up the reason why we stopped oftentimes. It gets lost in the photograph. So when you're using your photographic reference, if you can't do a plein air painting of it, uh, if you're using your photographic reference, it's really good up front to stop and think, okay, what inspired me to take this photograph? And that's what you want to capture in your painting. And I do the same here. It's, it was the lighting, the lighting on the side of this house that really captured me. And just the, just the, it's such a typical farmhouse and it's out in the country and it's all those kinds of things I like. Uh, it's also, 
architectural. And I thought that would be a good lesson too because I found my students over the years, they really struggle with drawing. They don't necessarily understand uh, perspective. And so this lesson will cover some of that. And I think you'll find it really helpful. It's just simple lessons that will really help you build uh, when you're drawing structures to actually make them more convincing. Um, so those are some of the reasons. Also, I did, you'll see here that I have a couple of color studies. Well, I did a third color study also. And this one was with a totally different palette. You'll find in this demo that, I, uh, that I'm gonna use a very limited palette and probably an unusual palette. You will be surprised with the colors that are, that are actually gonna be on the palette. And I think you'll find that really interesting and really helpful and will encourage you to ex do some experimentation on your own. This painting here, this little study, I don't know if you can see that clearly. This, uh, I have it marked <clears throat> for a, a couple of reasons. There's grid marks on it, but there's also um, the uh, golden mean. I, I marked lines off on that, so we can talk about that later. But this study was done using just three colors, ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson, and uh, cadmium yellow pale, but just a mixtures of those and, and we'll talk about that when, when we get to the color. On this particular study here I used uh, ultramarine blue, cadmium red, and lemon yellow. So only the blue and this one was kept the same. I changed the red and I changed the yellow and wanted to see uh, what effect that would give me. As you can tell on both of these the composition was already set in my mind what I wanted to do. So it, at this stage all this was about was, uh, okay, what palette is going to be suitable for what I want to say? This was the very first color study I did. Um, I do a lot of these. I have notebooks full of these, uh, over uh, probably 1,100 of these. A lot of them plein air studies, a lot of them studio studies, working out color design, all of that. This is my preferred way to work. A lot of artists use a thumbnail. I do small studies, either in black and white or in color on gessoed paper. And then I just uh, mark off the, the uh, proportions that I want. So this was the first color study I did. And uh, the reason I have them both up is because my demo is going to be kind of a combination of these. Um, this one is a little bit darker than this. I'm uh, kind of in between somewhere I'm thinking about. So we're going to go I've got them both out for reference material. I'm going to use these photos to draw it off. And then we'll talk about eye level and horizon line, all that from that photo. So I want to, I'm going to do the monochromatic. I'm starting off with a monochromatic painting first because as I spoke earlier, uh, that really establishes everything. It not only firms up the composition, if this is a place the drawing will be firmed up, if there's any errors, this is the time for me to clean that up and refine it. I'll establish a pretty refined uh, monochromatic painting, and they're beautiful in their own right, even without color. I mean, it could be in some ways framed and, and be lovely as it is. I do not use white with that monochromatic block in. I'm using straight raw umber, and um, I'll talk all about that uh, when we get to that point. These are grid marks, and what I'm going to do first is I will tone this surface and let it set up a little bit, and then I'll, I'll uh, draw my lines down so that I can actually have my grid onto my surface, and then I'll begin the drawing with a brush after that sets a little bit. You know, the, this is the age of technology, and there's so many people that have cell phones, and they use uh, computers and a lot of things to, to figure out the things that I'm going to tell you about. But I love this tool, and I, in, all, in all the workshops that I have taught, I, I recommend my students get this tool. It's called a proportional scale. I call it a proportion wheel, but a proportional scale. It's a, it's a tool I used when I was illustrating for 10 years. It helps designers in, uh, in getting correct proportions. For instance, if you have a photograph that's 8 by 10 and it has to fit into a, a column of a magazine that's two and a half inches, this is the kind of thing they would use to accomplish that. So it's really valuable. But what I've found many, many, many times is 
students will do a sketch in their sketchbook. And, uh, oh, I really like this sketch. I want to do a larger painting of that. And so what they do is they, they'll go to their closet and they'll, yeah, I think I'll do it on this canvas. And so they pull it out and then they start doing the drawing from their sketch onto the canvas and it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because the proportions are different. The proportion of the sketch that they did and the proportion of the canvas that they chose are two different things. And so it's real important. This is part of the composition. Decide, even from the very uh, time that you select the image that you want to, uh, the subject that you want to use for your painting, one of the very first considerations you have to make after that is what proportion and size of canvas would best uh, communicate the concept that I have. So that's why it's in, this is a, a useful tool. If you don't use it, it's fine, but I'm still going, going to explain it because it is so helpful to students. So oftentimes what happens is, like I said just a second ago, is they'll do a small sketch and then they'll pull out a canvas out of their closet and the two don't match. And, and there's an incompatibility between the, uh, the sketch and what they put on the canvas. Well, if their concept was the sketch and it, the way it was composed, the, every, the organization of everything, and then it doesn't match the canvas, the concept has changed. So it's real important that we follow all the way through, once you make a decision on the front end, that you follow all the way through what you want to do. So for instance, let's say, um, what I want to point out is if your sketch is say, uh, let me turn it this way so I can actually see it better. Say you did a sketch that's uh, two inches by one and a half inches. One way to use this wheel is it has two parts to it. The inner part I, I use for smaller dimension of the canvas or the smaller dimension of your sketch and the larger one I use for the larger dimension of your sketch or your canvas. So say for instance your sketch is one at, at the larger dimension being two, your little thumbnail sketch, and your smaller dimension being one and a half inches. Once these two numbers are set, one and a half and two are lined up perfectly here, everything around this wheel now is proportional to that. So now you don't have to guess what size canvas you're going to need. All you got to do is go around the wheel and see what lines up with something you have. So I found, wow, 12 by 16 lines up. So if I have my little sketch as two by one and a half inches, I know that if I select a 12 by 16 canvas, it's going to fit on that perfect. And all I'll have to do is grid off my little thumbnail, enlarge it onto the 12 by 16, everything will fit just the way it's supposed to. The other beautiful thing about this is you'll, to prove my point, that uh, if you look on the wheel, 9 by 12 lines up, another standard size canvas. Then we spoke of the 12 by 16, that lines up. 18 by 24 lines up, all standard sizes that you can easily buy frames for without having anything custom made. 30 by 40 lines up. So now I know from that one and a half by two inch sketch, all these canvases are options for me that the composition will fit perfectly on there. So this is a useful tool. They're not that expensive. You can get them. Uh, I ordered them just through an art supply store. You just need to define what it is. It's called a proportional scale. This is called a PS80. And I think this is because, what is this? Like an eight inch or something like that. But they come in two different sizes. Do not worry about this window here. That's for uh, photographers when they're sizing the reduction of the uh, photograph down to what they need to do. Forget that. You're only concerned about the two outside uh, wheels, the numbers on the outside. So I hope that's helpful. My, it'll save you a lot of time. I know you can figure this up in, um, in, uh, on your, uh, what is it? Cell, your cell phone, I guess, will give you all this stuff. Oh, another thing, too. As w when we talk about the, the composition later, we, we're going to mention the golden mean, which is... It, mathematically, it works out to 0.618. Uh, 
is a mathematical number. So you, you would multiply 0.618 times whatever the dimension of your canvas would be. We're just going to go with a simple number and round that off to 0 0.6. 0 0.618 would be about 6 and, and 3 sixteenths of an inch on a ruler um, out, out of a, a 10 inch, we'll say in a, on a dimension of 10 inches, the golden mean would be at 6 and 3 sixteenths inches. That would be a mark. I'm, I'm going to show you that on this canvas here. But the, um, so this wheel will also do that if you set everything on 6 and 10. There's 6 and 10 lined up. Everything around this now will be helpful. For instance, then, if the, if the uh, largest, uh, one of the dimensions of the canvas that you're uh, going to do your final painting on is 20 inches in one dimension, and you want to know what the uh, golden mean uh, uh, measurement would be, I just look down, I find it's 12 inches. Uh, so all I need to do then, if this is, say this is 20 inches, I measure in 12 inches from this side, draw a line, measure in 12 inches from this side, draw a line, actually it'd be 12, draw it here, measure in here, draw it here, I've got the golden mean uh, vertically, and then I do the same from the bottom, whatever that dimension is, uh, say that's, let's say it's 20, 20, uh, 25 inches, we'll say that for just for simplicity, if it's 25 inches, I'll measure up from the bottom 15 inches, draw a horizontal line, measure down from the top 15 inches, draw a horizontal line. Now I've got the four golden mean points. And it's a really easy, quick way to determine those just with this simple wheel. And um, so if you haven't used one, I encourage you to try it. It takes a little bit of practice, but I hope I've explained it clearly enough that you're going to find it really simple and a useful tool. I would have a difficult time not having this in my studio. It is something I've used for years and years and years and will continue using it just because it saves me a ton of time and keeps me in many ways from making mistakes. Well, one of the things, I, I'd like to wear my hat while I paint. I hope you don't object. But it is an Oil Painters of America hat. And since I'm an oil painter, I think it's appropriate. So I'm going to wear it. <laughs> hope you don't mind. back in the studio today and today is the day that we apply color to the monochromatic blocking that I did yesterday. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's demo and today we established yesterday the values of the piece so today we're applying the color and I've used a limited palette for years and years and years probably uh, two-thirds of my career. When I first started in, in the fine arts I had probably 15 or so colors on my palette and um, I learned from some artists just through the years that they were limiting their palette. And so I took that to heart and limited my palette just down to the three primaries. And uh, once I discovered just how much could be done with the three colors, I've pretty much stuck with it all these years of my career. Um, so the painting I'm doing today, the, the use of color today, I'm just using ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson, and cadmium yellow pale. I need to show you that uh, what can be done with that uh, limited palette. And here I've laid out the uh, color, uh, color chart. And this is the ultramarine blue, this is alizarin crimson, and this is the cadmium yellow pale. And all these other mixtures, the complements and the tertiary colors are all mixed just from those three primaries. So this, all these mixtures, is a three primary palette, and you can see the great variety. And this just shows, shows the pure mixtures. These are just with uh, that color with white added. And so you can see the beauty of that, but what you don't see on this chart is all the intermixing, which um, that's how you achieve your grays. Remember when you're doing color that 
when you're using two of the primaries, for instance, the blue and the red, you're going to get beautiful violet tones. If you use the red and the yellow, you're going to get your beautiful oranges. So remember, anytime all three primaries are in a mixture, you're ending up with some variation of gray, brownish grays. depends how you want to do that. But all three primaries mixed together will give you some sort of gray. If you then add a little extra, one of the primaries, you can uh, extend that gray to favor, uh, say for instance, if you used alizarin crimson, a little bit extra alizarin crimson in that original gray mixture, you can make it a reddish, a reddish gray to favor that side. So it's, it's just, um, there's so much variety that can be created using a three color palette that I've stuck with it. We're going to be doing a uh, future video that's going to focus strictly on color and the many things I've learned about color, the great variations that can be achieved with it, how to use various parts of the color wheel, all that we're going to do on the next video. So that might be something you'd really want to watch out for. But for this demo today, I want to just talk about a couple of things. I'm going to use a very limited palette today, and the palette is called a, a square quadratic, and I will uh, demonstrate that, what that means later. But what I want to do now is just show you right here with all these examples. These are just a, a handful of examples, all done with exactly the same palette. This palette right here, ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson, cabin yellow pale. But you can see, based on all these, what variety we have. For instance, if you take this one right here and compare it with this, you would say, wow, you, that cannot be the same palette, but it really is. It's still ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson, cabin yellow pale. So this one, of course, I had a different concept, and it was a sunset scene. This one, much cooler and uh, more just more peaceful and relaxed. This one, uh, uh, the overall feel is much warmer. This one, much cooler, and yet the same palette. One of the things that affected that is that I toned this surface with a reddish uh, brown tone. So brown meaning I had all three primaries mixed together, which gave me a neutral or a brownish grayish tone. And then I added just a little bit more alizarin crimson to it, which turned it to a reddish brown. And so this surface was toned first with that. And you can see it affects everything that goes on top of it. That underlying tone affects all the colors that go on top. In this case, I used same palette, but a blue tone, and look at the difference. And both of them are very interesting in their own way. So just because we're using three colors, the, the variety that can be achieved with those is almost infinite. And then every time you tone your surface with a different tone, you end up with another whole uh, feeling to your piece. So I hope you'll try the three color palette. It may, may not suit you uh, forever, but I know that students that have uh, struggled with color, they generally have a lot of uh, different uh, colors laid out, laid out on their palette. And when they're, they may not use them all, I find that a lot, they've got them there, but they're not using them. And then sometimes when they do use a color, it's not intermixed with others, and so when they put the color note down, it's not harmonious with the rest of the painting. It, it creates a, a disharmony. And so by having, uh, having my students over the years limit the palette, they have found they can be much more expressive. They learn what their colors will do for them because they have to really think and mix, intermix everything, and so it... Um, really has been beneficial to them and probably one of the most exciting discoveries they have made when they talk to me later and say, you know, when you had us go to the three color palette, it totally changed what I was doing. And it's been really helpful. So I think if you try it also, just to see what you think of it. And uh, as we get into more today and then in the future color video, I think you're gonna be astounded uh, 
what you'll discover just using a limited palette. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be doing an extensive uh, instructional video later on just about color here, but I wanted to explain to you a little bit uh, today before I actually start working, applying color to my uh, monochromatic block in that I did yesterday. I want to talk to you about the palette that I'm using that I've chosen for this particular uh, demonstration. Over here, we see the, the color wheel, which I think is a valuable thing for each of you to do is to mix your own color wheel. And I'm going to take this mask off, but I want to show you. All these are mixed, but this is still a three color primary palette. The yellow, the ultramarine blue, and the alizarin crimson. All these others are mixed with that. The benefit of doing this is that these are not tube colors. These were all mixed. And so there is value in establishing this and doing it. You only have to do it one time because once you, you put the effort into doing the color wheel here and, and these various tones as, you, as white is added, because over here, do you see this? This is very hard to distinguish. This is a blue, violet, violet, red, violet. Just looking at the dark, the, the mixture, you cannot, it's very difficult to discern what those are. And so by adding white, it breaks it down. And so with the addition of white, we can make a very clear distinction now between each one of those, which is important. So the benefit of doing this wheel first and spending the time doing it and really concentrating on getting a clear separation between each one of these colors around the wheel, if you do that one time, then any time you want to uh, select uh, a particular uh, color scheme from a color wheel, all you need to do is you can mix on your palette and then match. Say, for instance, you want a blue-green on your palette, then you can just mix. You can mix up the, the blue and the yellow together so that it matches, say, that color right there. And so then you know, okay, I've got a blue-green. But another thing to do, if you don't want to do that every single time, and uh, it'll save you a lot of time, it'll take a lot of time up front and a lot of paint up front, but that's why these tubes are really helpful. Um, they come open in the bottom and you can mix up a, a pile of the, uh, any one of these colors you want, put it in the tube, tamp it down, get all the air out, seal the bottom, and then just put a color code on the outside of it and you have um, your tube, your, your uh, paint mixture already done for you. And so then whatever you need around the wheel, you just go to that tube, squeeze it out, and you're done. You don't have to mix it every time. Um, but I want to point out the palette I'm using for this painting. This whole series of, of uh, pictures right here that I've done are all using what is called a square quadratic. Square meaning that the four, the quadratic meaning four colors on this color wheel and they're equally spaced so they form a square. So it would be, for instance, every third color. So if, we, if yellow's on the palette, we, I know I want, if we say we want yellow on the palette, you would count off. One, two, it'd be the third color. The next one would be a blue-green. One, two, three, the next color on your palette would be a violet. One, two, three, the next one would be red-orange. Do you notice what's going on here? Actually, you have two sets of complements. You have the yellow and you have the violet, you have the red-orange, and you have the blue-green. But it's called a quadratic. So I want to show you this. This is a little mask I made that goes on here. The palette I'm using for this painting, which is, this is a study for it, is this palette right here. It's uh, yellow-orange yellow, orange, green, blue, violet, and red. That's how this painting was done. That's how this painting was done. And look at the difference. I mean, there's considerable difference, exactly the same palette. And what the, this shows the palette, just separated out so you can clearly see, this is the palette I'm using for this monochromatic, for this painting. 
These are mixtures that were done just from these. So once these mixtures are made, if you notice here, there's only one primary in this whole, uh, on, the, on the palette that's selected, and the only primary is the, in this case, the red, alizarin crimson. We'll get into this in the color video. This doesn't always have to be alizarin crimson. You can put any red in there, and what that will do is it will change, again, the whole look of the painting that you're creating. So every one of these can be changed based on what that primary is that you've chosen there. But for this particular piece, it's alizarin crimson. It's only one primary, but two sets of complements. So look at the difference between that and this. Same palette. The difference is this was toned with a kind of an orange a tone. This was toned with a red tone. In other words, this was toned with straight alizarin crimson and then rubbed down. So it had kind of a pinkish cast to it. This painting was created from that. What this card represents is this is the palette. There's a lizard and crimson, there's a blue violet, there's green, and there's yellow orange. That, that represents a palette that I'm going to put out today for the demo. These are mixtures that have been created just from those colors. So what's really interesting is I have stacks of these, and that's what we'll get into in the next video. For every possible combination I could come up with using a three color palette and, and um, various combinations. And I have mixtures for every single one that shows variety and I've done a painting for each one that shows what can be created from that mixture. So this has proved to be really handy because they're always on file and I can flip through, oh yeah, I can flip through them and say, yeah, this palette will work well for what I want to say or communicate in the painting that I'm creating. So it's very valuable. Down here are my notes and I've marked, this is the UB represents ultramarine blue, the AC, alizarin crimson, the yellow, cadmium yellow pale, and then I've identified what it is. It's a square quadratic. The palette used for these mixtures, for this painting, is red, blue, violet, green, yellow, orange, shown right up there. So all this is, is very, I have it all very systematic, very clear, so that these things I can flip through and, and decide. This helps me in the concept stage, which we talked about yesterday. This helps me in the concept stage to define the next step, okay? I've established my values. I've, I've been thinking about the mood I want to uh, create. Now what palette is going to work best with that? And that's how all this is selected. These pieces here, if you, if you view the the uh, this just this mask this is a as you see four it has four slots in it view the color wheel as a clock so it's real easy to discern this is the palette i'm using of course i just pointed that out but if you just click that to the right one spot now you've got another four that you can use that are totally different but another square quadratic. Do you see how it forms a square? If you were to take the center point of each one and draw to the center of each one, it forms a square. That's why they called it a square quad quadratic. Click it again, shoot, and you're back to another uh, quadratic. There's three in this because now if I click it to the right again, I'm back to the palette that I've selected for this particular demo. So you can see there's three possible square quadratics. Remember to, anytime you change any one of these primaries, the red, the blue, and the yellow, anytime you would change just one of those, you create another whole range of possibilities in, in color scheme and what the ultimate uh, painting will look like. These particular pieces here then, this represents the um, this is a square quadratic also. All these are square quadratics. This is what the palette looks like. It's yellow, uh, blue-green, violet, and red-orange. This is the painting created from that, from that mixture, and these are the mixtures right here. So these three here go together. That's the mixtures that was created from those four pieces right there, those four uh, uh, 
color choice right there, and then this is a painting created from that. And then the third uh, quadratic is this one over here, which is blue, red, violet, orange, and yellow, green. And you can see that there. Here's the color mixtures, just some of them. This isn't the end. It's a beginning, but what I tried to do in these color mixtures is show how dark I could get, the darkest dark I could achieve, and then some of the grays and the variety that I could create using that palette also. And then there's the painting for it. So I hope that's helpful. This is the basis for what we're going to do here today uh, as I begin the color uh, block in. All right, now that we've discussed the color theory, I've uh, laid out the paint that I'm going to use for this particular painting. But first, before I actually start mixing the paint, I wanted to just show you what I'm, what I'm using. I use a variety of different uh, uh, companies. I use Gamblin Paint. I've used Winsor Newton. I've used Grumbacher. used Michael Harding. I've used uh, Williamsburg, Utrecht a number of different things. Um, so I thought it'd be very interesting. This one, I'm using three different brands for, for you. Uh, the Ultramarine Blue is a Utrecht brand. Uh, the Alizarin Crimson is a Williamsburg. And the uh, Cadmium Yellow is a Michael Harding. So, um, but what I, for years, I've been using two whites, and I mix them together. I think I learned that from some of the plein air painters years ago, that they were using a, an alkyd white on location because it sped up the drying of their painting. So I use that pretty much when I'm painting on location, the, the Griffin alkyd white, uh, titanium white. In the studio, I add a little bit of permalba white to that to slow the drying down just a little bit because alka does dry pretty fast. So anyway, these are the colors that I'm going to be mixing for this painting. I put out about half and half here. Um, there's no great rule to any of this. It's just something I do. I'll mix these together. See, so if you notice, I don't know if that'll, it'll pick up on the camera, but the alkyd white is, when you, these two are together, do you notice the difference? The alkyd is warmer than the permalba white. It's noticeably different uh, in the temperature of the white. So I just mix them together. Put it up here. It's helpful when you're, when you're laying out your paint to put it out more in a string like that and then just work off the end. That way you don't pollute the whole string of paint. I mean, paint's pretty expensive as it is, so you don't have to ruin a whole batch of it. You can extend its life a little bit. All right, now what I'm going to do next, just bear in mind that the three colors I'm using, again, ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson, and cadmium yellow. The cadmium yellow pale is a Winsor Newton product. For this piece, it's a minor change, but for this piece I'm using Michael Harding's um, cadmium yellow. So I'm still going to need to mix, and I'm going to mix to the color wheel, which I just spoke about, how we can use that. So I'm going to lay out. The, the alizarin fits that spot right there, so I, that, that obviously you don't have to mix. But I need to use that to mix to the yellow, the yellow orange, and I need to mix to the green, and I need to mix up the blue violet. So I'm going to lay out some blue. Put a little, it's not going to take a lot of alizarin crimson, but I'm going to put a little bit out and see 
how we're doing. So I'll mix that together. I should really put out more, but I'm going to yeah, I should probably put out a little more so that I don't have to remix this during the demo. So I'm going to do that now. I'll just go add more. So we have a nice pile of paint here that'll last through the whole demo. Now I'll have to add a little bit of white to this to discern if I'm even close to blue-violet at all. Because you can see how dark that is right now. It's hard to tell anything about it. So I'll mix it up good first. It looks a little bit violet to me. So I may need to add a little more blue. We'll see. So what I'll do is I'll take a little bit of white, put it down here. Clean off the palette knife. You don't white, want white infiltrating this. Take just a little bit, mix in there. See where that stands. We might not be too far off, actually. Mix that up really good. Take that, put that on the palette knife, lay it over here. We're pretty close. It's amazing. That's pretty close. Wow, that went pretty easy. Okay, we'll just leave that. So we've got the blue violet. Oh, an important point. Um, once you set a palette, whether it's whatever that palette is, I think it's valuable to set your palette up the same way every time. Because af after you've been painting a while, you're dipping into color and it almost becomes intuitive. And so if you know, you don't even have to think about where the color is, you just know, this is where my blues are gonna be, this is where my reds normally are, and this is where my yellows and greens normally are. Then you just automatically reach for those when you need them. You don't have to think and look on your palette and say, oh, where, where is it? So I always, and I've had this same setup for a long time. Mine, the way I set up my palette is sort of prismatic. I always have the white on the left. This is not a law. I mean, everybody sets up their palette different. I just say once you decide on what's comfortable for you, set it up the same every time. But for me, I put white on the left, and then I go through the range of colors. I'll start with my blues, move those into the violets, into the reds, the reds into the oranges, uh, yellow oranges into the yellow and then on the far right will be my greens just depends what I need so it and then of course the greens added with the blue they come back around into blue green back into blue so it, it almost it makes a circle and so I just lay them out this is going to be my blue violet so you know don't since I don't have blue my ultramarine blue would be there if I had blue on the palette. But I've used blue only to mix. So the next one in line next to the blue would be the blue-violet. Then you would have violet. Then you'd have red-violet. Then you'd have red. So blue-violet for me goes there. Make sure my palette knife is clean. I don't like to waste paint. It's expensive, so I clean this off and add it to the string here. All right, the next one we're going to do is the, um, let's see, it's blue-violet, then it's the red. So I'll just put out the red as is. It's in the next string here. So I'll put out red. Probably won't need a lot of that. It's pretty powerful. And then we're going into the yellow-orange. So I've got a mix to that right there. See, we've done the... We've done the blue-violet, one, two, three, the next one was red, one, two, three, the next one then in our little color scheme is yellow-orange, so I need to mix to that. So I'll start first with, I need to clean the palette. You want all this off of here, you don't want this influencing anything. I also am uh, a firm believer in keeping your palette clean, keeping your brushes clean, 
Um, I clean my brushes after every painting session and uh, just try to keep the palette, everything nice, neat and clean. I think it helps for a uh, nice clean color. Um, I just think it's helpful. So, okay. We're going to yellow orange. So I'm gonna mainly it's yellow orange, so I'm putting out a lot of yellow. And it will take just the smallest amount of alizarin to achieve that. So I'm gonna just take a little bit off the end, and I can always add more, but I don't want to overdo it because if I do it's going to uh, take a lot more yellow to bring it up to where it needs to be. This will be a little bit harder to discern because of, uh, oh, it's yellow orange. I had it, I was looking at yellow. Okay. Yellow orange. Pretty close. I want to make a bigger pile, so I'm going to add a little more yet. I kind of have this bad habit of not mixing up enough paint. And uh, it's one thing I would like to improve in my work is just be able to use more paint, but it's been a slow, slow tentative process. That's not bad, it's pretty close. I think I need, wow, well, it's hard to, the yellows, they're, they're a little bit hard to discern. I think that's pretty close. I'll go with that. It definitely feels like yellow orange. Just don't know if it's, I nailed it. Okay, so yellow orange goes here. Okay, we've got one more to mix, and that is the green, which will be this one right here. So again, yellow's important part of that. We'll put out some yellow. And add blue to it. I need to put out the blue. I don't know how much it'll take. I'll just have to play with it here. The more you do this, the more comfortable you get that you kind of know what you're going to need to achieve the color you're after. And by using a, a simple palette, a limited palette like I've chosen to do here, we become, you can become very comfortable with your mixtures because you've mixed them so much. So you know, well, if I mix these two together, I pretty much know what I'm going to get. And that's uh, one of the benefits also of a limited palette. There would be a lot that would disagree with me and say, well, you're, you're uh, limiting your options, which is true. Then that's what we're doing, limi limiting the options. But what has happened is we uh, are able to achieve color harmony a lot, lot easier. And um, particularly with as many students as I've taught and how this has revolutionized their work and revolutionized mine also in the early days, that... Uh, I would at least recommend that you try this and start this way. You can always add more as you get really comfortable with color mixing. I think I need to go just a little more blue. Not much, that might be too much. Uh, 
That's pretty good. We'll go with that. You know what? I'm going to make a bigger batch. I just don't want to come up short. So I know what it's got it has to be. I'm going to add a little more here. So what do you think of this palette? Kind of weird, huh? Have you ever tried a palette like this? One primary, two different complements. It's not traditional, that's for sure. But my goodness, the uh, it's fun. I love experimenting with color. I know when I uh, learned about the two color, the three color uh, limited palette, three primary palette, I literally spent two weeks mixing color. Didn't do anything but mix color. And made all kinds of color charts, all kinds of combinations that I could come up with. I just loved it. It was, it was like the, the light bulb came on and I just couldn't stop. I was, uh, you know, people, some people do not like the color charts, making color charts, because they're tedious. And they take a lot of time and you have to really concentrate and you have to really spend time getting those mixtures just right. But I loved, I loved doing the color wheels. I mean, the color charts. They were so helpful. And so if you can bring yourself to do it, it's handy. Like that chart I had out earlier where I had the string of color and then mixed white with them to show the, t the different tints. All oh, really valuable. And then you can start taking combinations and mixing up all your grays and see what See what red, the different kinds of reds, alizarin and green would do. What, what um, a yellow, green, and a uh, red, red orange will give you. There's just so many beautiful combinations and options that create interest in your paintings. And also they contribute to your personal style. After a while, your work will be recognizable as yours alone, very unique. It's not only your concept and it's not only the way you design your paintings and not only the way you establish the value structure in them, but your color is also part of you and you will gravitate to certain colors that appeal to you. It will just happen naturally. So what I'm offering you here through mixing these is you will get really comfortable with your color. I'm not saying these are the colors to use. I'm just saying this ought to give you an idea that, hey, there's more to this than I've been doing. And so uh, maybe I'm gonna experiment with some other variations and see, and you will settle in on, some, on a palette or a, a, a few colors on your, on your palette that just, they speak to you and they, they, they resonate who you are. And um, I think that's what you're ultimately gonna end up with. It'll, this, your palette choices and you, the way you, or, uh, you put your color combinations together, all that's going to make your paintings unique. And so when one sees them from across the room, they're gonna say, I know whose work that is because it's gonna stand out. It's not gonna be like everybody else's. All right, I wanna do just a couple of things. I wanna mix up uh, some variations. As I spoke, we had two sets of compliments here. So what would happen if I mix the two complements together? That's gonna to give me what? A variety of grays, which I'm gonna have grays in here. There's quite a bit of gray in this painting. Varieties of gray, I don't mean like blue gray, I just mean variations of gray. We, we oftentimes call it mud, the mud. Mud is beautiful. Uh, sometimes we talk about muddy color. Well, it depends what you mean by muddy color. But mud is really created by all three primaries mixed together. And those can be beautiful if used in the right context. The one thing we have to be careful of as artists is we have to, just as we speak about value, not having all of the values the same, the same shape and value, but a priority of values, a hierarchy of values, we do the same with color. I think if you create a, a painting that's full of uh, intense primaries, uh, intense, I mean the intense color, um, that that 
painting is going to scream at you, but it, it will get old pretty quick. It's like a, a person who is speaking to an audience. If their if their uh, tone, their level, their the level that they speak is the same all the time, it gets sort of boring. But when they're speaking loud and then they whisper quietly, they emphasize something. And color is kind of the same way. If we, the grays really, all the variations of grays in a painting, when you use a, a primary then or a, an, an intense color, it really stands out and has meaning. It's like speaking softly and then emphasizing something with a strong note. Raise your voice a little bit or a stronger color. I view color kind of the same way. And so you don't want everything the same. You don't want a painting that's totally gray and it'll be boring. You need a little accent in there and the same, you don't want a color that's just high intensity, everything high intensity and no, nothing to subdue it and soften it down. So I think a good painting also is not only all the other things that we've already talked about, but it's this nice balance between color and the, the intensity and the grayness of color, the, the muted color. I think all that's really important. So what I want to do is I want to mix up just some, uh, mix up two of these complements together and then use those as a, uh, just some grays down here that I can use. I'll leave this out because I'm going to have some green. I'll be mixing some green and red together, so I'm just going to put it right here. So I'm going to take uh, some of this green almost wish I'd mixed up a little more. Okay, that's green. What's the complement of that green? It's gonna be the red, lizard and crimson. Why is that? Why, why does this make brown? Because what does green have in it? It already has two primaries in it. What are they? They're blue and they're yellow. That's two primaries. We're adding the third primary, which is the red. That's why we end up with a brownish, uh, a neutral. So we'll put a little bit of red in that. Depending on how much of each of these we put in, I'm going to just try to go to something neutral. If I need something that then becomes a little redder or a little greener, I'll just dip into one of whatever I need and I can mix it into some of that and change that tone. So I'm just going to start here with a little bit of red in this mixture and see what we get. See how that's turning it? See how that's turning it to greenish brown right now? It is a beautiful color. So I'm gonna just go to more brown. It's getting to the point now that it still has an influence of green in it where you can still feel the green. More red will neutralize it even more. See that now? You really can't tell whether that is green or red. I call that then, that's a pretty neutral mixture. And that's done with complements. Great way to, to uh, mix paint and use these mixtures in your paintings. All right, that's one complement mixture. The other one will be blue-violet. What's gonna happen here, I think, the blue violet and this yellow orange are gonna definitely give me something to the green, the green range. So I'm gonna put some blue violet out. too will be kind of a brownish green. Pretty dark. Okay, that's, that's pretty, it still has a strong influence of green, which I knew it would, but that'll work fine. So I'm gonna leave that there. I wanna do two more things. 
and then we'll be ready. I'm going to mix up just some convenience colors. I'm going to mix up some blue violet. Remember, this is this is the palette right here. But I can mix with that. If I mix those two together, what am I going to end up with? I could end up with a violet or a red violet. And every one of those would still maintain, even if I added those in here, I'm not going to do it because I want to leave it clear for you that this is the palette. But I, this is also just as legitimate because I can mix with these two a violet and a red violet. And I could place them there and it would still be, this would still be the palette because I can, at any point along the doing of this painting here, I can mix these two together and achieve a violet and a red violet. And the same over here, I can achieve a red orange and an orange. Here I can achieve a variety of greens, a yellow green and a uh, blue green, which go on this side, yellow green here, blue green here. Let me, just for convenience, I want to mix up a violet, which I'm going to have. I'll, I'll put it over here. I'll put a violet here, and I want to mix up an orange, and I'll put an orange here, and I'll mix up a, a more of a yellowish green. I'm going to put it here, and I'll just have them there. But just bear in mind, that's the palette. So let me do that. It won't take but a few minutes, and I'll be ready.
All right, these mixtures are uh, mixed up and completed now, and so I'm going to start applying paint to this monochromatic block in. And this this uh, study here is going to be helpful in completing that, so I will try to mix, you know, to some of these mixtures here. I want to start with the with the house since that's the real important point of this and it's the focal point. So I want to I'm going to work in the shadows first. I'm not using just a straight blue-violet. I'm graying it down just a little bit with uh, the green.
a little too dark. So I'll lighten it. As you can see yesterday, uh, when we did the monochromatic, that was all about establishing the values that I wanted. I'm trying to match those. That's, today I don't have to think about value that much, although there will be slight adjustments because this is a painting and now it's in color. But the values that I set yesterday really guide me through the painting today. And so today my main concern is about color and getting the the right temperature of the color, the right hue, the right intensity, all those things. And my feeling right now is um, I want to kind of get this 
covered, the canvas covered, at least in this area, so that I have a good feeling of where I'm going. And not that these statements are the final statement yet. Uh, they're gonna have, I'm gonna have to come back and adjust and we'll change maybe the temperature in an area a little bit, add some accents here and there. But um, the, yeah, this is about just the color today and using that palette that we discussed earlier. So I'm working this area, it is the focal point obviously, the house is, but I wanna work areas around it too so that everything sorts, sort of uh, begins to relate and then I have an overall feeling. I'm not real good at visualizing what a finished painting is going to look like. It kind of evolves for me as we go through it. And I say, oh, well, I need to make an adjustment here. No, I don't like that. I'm going to rub that part out or change it somewhat. And so it, it, I'm a little more flexible than, than uh, I like my values. We're going to stick with that. That's pretty inflexible. But as far as color choices, they can be adjusted as long as they stay within that value range that I've already created. So I'm working an area here. Now I want to see, okay, what's the sky value? What's that color going to look like relative to what I've already put down here? And so I'm going to mix up next now this sky color, this sky color right here, and um, just lay it in. I want to really get my sky resolved if I can leave the trees for right now, let the sky set up a little bit so that when I come back in with the trees, I can go over the, over the background sky and not disturb it too much. So that's my thought patterns right now. Hey, would you like to win a beautiful painting worth almost $3,000? We've got a beautiful Joe McGurl plein air study that he's done of the sunset in Maine. It's gorgeous. If you want to have an opportunity to win it, go to paintinggiveaway.com. Just put in your email. That's all you've got to do, and you only need to enter once. We'll be giving away the prize at the end of May. Go to paintinggiveaway.com. Great paintings seem to have a color harmony. Everything just works together. But how do painters create this harmony? Often, painters get themselves in trouble by having too many colors. Though you want paintings to look colorful, each color you add can throw your painting out of harmony. One of the secrets to creating a sense of harmony and balance in your paintings is all about how you mix and work with the colors using a limited palette, meaning just three colors plus white. That's why if you take the time to learn the fundamentals of working in a limited palette, it can dramatically improve the quality of your paintings. In this all-new instructional DVD, John Potoshnik, one of the most talented landscape painters in the United States, will guide you through his entire step-by-step -step process for painting a beautiful country landscape scene using a limited palette. In limited palette landscapes, you'll discover how to select your subject and identify exactly what you want to portray on the canvas. John's secret to establishing value and working with dark and light accents to highlight the various points of interest. You'll also discover how to work with a muted palette that speaks softly and almost seduces your viewer into the painting. And how to paint all of the details of a beautiful two-story home in a country scene including the surrounding trees, the sky, foreground, background, and more. John Potoshnik is a highly technical master painter and an amazing teacher as well. Join him and discover how to take your painting skills to the next level. And of course, that's one of the benefits of using a limited palette because there's so few colors there, they have to be intermixed. If you didn't intermix, you would have a one horrible looking painting. After implementing the limited palette in your paintings, you'll see your paintings come alive with balance and color harmony. Limited Palette Landscapes with John Potoshnik is now available on DVD and streaming video.
That was Limited Palette Landscapes with John Potoshnik, one of the best color experts on earth. If you want to learn more about that video, you can go to lilyartvideo.com. Now let's learn more about John. Hi, I'm John Potoshnik. I'm an artist working in the fine arts. I'm a landscape painter and I work in oil. I've worked as a freelance illustrator for 10 years in Dallas from 1972 to 1982. And then in uh, the illustration field started changing about 1982 or so, maybe a little prior to that. I noticed a lot of illustrators leaving the field and getting into fine art. And I had always wanted to be in the fine art, but was told I'd never make a living at it. And so in 1982, I made the leap into painting. And uh, the part I enjoy most about painting is the freedom that I have as a painter. In the illustration field, of course, you're always trying to work for an art director or meet a client's expectation. In the fine arts and in painting, uh, I'm able to paint what I want in the way I want it. And I feel now that my true personality and my true uh, temperament, all that is showing through my painting, and I think that's what I enjoy the most. What inspires me to keep painting after being in this business as a fine artist for more than 30 years, um, it's the whole idea of creating, trying new things, experimenting, uh, seeing my work improve is huge, but you know, I'm in the business of sell paintings. And so when someone enjoys my paintings and is willing to put the money out to purchase them and I hear from them periodically and, and feel that appreciation and love for the work I do, that is very satisfying. And that really does help. That encouragement keeps me going. Uh, but I think there's just a need to create. There's, a, there's, a, there's something when one creates that there's a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction that oftentimes we don't get in other lines of work. And I think we're really blessed in that way to, to be an artist and to be able to create things and see a product that has come off of our hands. I'm best known for landscape painting, and I'm drawn to that subject matter because as a child, my, my uh, grandparents lived on a farm. One set of my grandparents lived on a farm, and we visited there. I grew up in a fairly small Midwestern town. I was close to the country. I always liked the outdoors, enjoyed the farm, enjoyed the country, and so it is just a natural outgrowth of my childhood. I think I'm ending up painting my, my memories and uh, you know all my experiences, a lot of my experiences growing up. I find peace in the country too. It's open and it's not congested and it's, you can feel the wind and the breeze and the smells and hear the bugs and the, all the animals, all that stuff appeals to me and I like to be able to capture those kinds of moods and feelings in my work. The important thing for an artist is to paint what they're passionate about and what they know. If, that ha if they love painting the figure and the challenge of it and the different moods that can be expressed through figurative painting, that's what they should be painting. It just happens in my life and my, because of my childhood that I mentioned earlier is that um, I'm drawn to the landscape. I'm drawn to all the moods of landscape. I love the outdoors. Uh, you know, so that's why I paint the landscape. But not everybody should paint the landscape if they're not passionate about it. So I'd say paint your passion. Paint what you know. Don't paint a subject just because you think there's a market for it. I'd say certainly be honest with yourself. Paint what you know and what you love and what you're passionate about. There will be a market for it. My style of painting is uh, sometimes hard to describe. I, an article was done on me several years ago and they described my painting as naturalism. And I like that word a lot. Naturalism to me is I'm not trying to enhance necessarily or romanticize. Naturalism came about because of the classical movement and they were saying that uh, the classical elevated and idealized the subject. I try not to idealize the subject. However, I do clean things up a little bit to make it a little more pleasing. I use oil because it suits my temperament. Um, I worked as an illustrator. I worked in watercolor and Martin, Dr. Martin dyes and acrylic, but oil painting is flexible. It doesn't dry as fast. 
course, watercolor doesn't either, but oil is more, um, I can manipulate it. I can put something down, if I don't like it, I can take it out. Take it all the way out, start over. So I just like the flexibility of it. I love the uh, acrylic. When I use acrylic, after it dries, it changes color. It changes the value slightly. If I remember right, it dries slightly darker than when you put it down. So it was hard to rematch, to match that color exactly once it was dried. Oil, I don't have that problem. It's just, um, it just suits me perfect. The most difficult thing about oil painting is painting. <laughs> I'm more of a smooth uh, painter. In other words, my surfaces are smooth and more brushed out. I appreciate the painters that use more textural quality to their oil painting and broader brush strokes and all that. It doesn't necessarily suit my temperament, so I struggle with that. But I would like to learn how to do that a little better. How to be a little more expressive with the paint. I love the paintings that when I have a vision in my mind as to the mood I want to create, that I'm able to accomplish that mood and, and really get the feel of what I had in my mind and capture nature as I feel it. When I can do that, I think that's a successful painting and those, of course, are the standouts to me. I've seen some real development in my recent work and it is, they are receiving awards. I think one of the last paintings I completed that I was really proud of when I did it and I thought it was special, but when it received the silver medal at the Oil Painters of America National Show, that kind of confirmed what I, what I had been feeling, that it, it was a good painting. And so that one I'm very proud of. I have favorites for different reasons, but I would say this painting called Be Still My Soul, which uh, recently won that silver medal, is, is at least it's on my mind right now, is one of my favorite paintings. Uh, my unique style is created by color because I think every individual has their own color sense. Their, I think their personality and temperament lead them to choose certain colors. So that is certainly the case with me. And then limiting that palette, I think has greatly helped me to use it in an effective way because I don't have so many colors I have to concern myself with. And I have learned with a limited palette that I can create about any mood that I want in nature. To use a limited palette means a, obviously a small number of colors, uh, tube colors that one would put on the, on the palette. People have different ideas of what limited would mean. I've, I mean, some would call it probably 10 colors limited. In fact, I've, I've read that in places. They say, I'll use a limited palette, but there's 10 colors on their palette. Mine is str very strictly limited in that mine is usually just the three primaries plus white. Once in a while, I will, I will add one or two other colors. But I would say, for me, a limited palette is probably five or less colors. A limited palette, I think, has really helped uh, harmonize my paintings and has given me a little more, believe it or not, a little more freedom to express myself as far as color goes. It simplifies my working methods. And I have learned that by, by being forced to use all of the color on the palette to mix certain colors, that uh, the painting automatically ends up harmonious. And that is super important to me, that I have a harmonious painting and not some color that's stuck in there that doesn't relate with the others. So by using a limited palette, I'm forced to intermix everything, and therefore it just it ends up a much better painting. I enjoy the challenge of it, the effects that one can get and the surprises. It's just, um, it's never ending. And if one changes up the primaries, then you can start all over again. And it's just a whole new challenge and new experimentation and a new joy. So it's endless with me. I just, I love the limited palette. I love the possibilities of it. I love the challenges of it. All that to me is fine. I seem to be able to mix every color that I need. So it just simplifies for me the whole working process. The hardest thing about mixing, uh, color with a limited palette. I think the tendency would be is we are trying to match exactly the color we're seeing. For instance, if we're painting out in landscape, out in nature, plein air, and we're trying after a certain green, and we may not be able to achieve that certain green with the particular 
colors we have selected for our palette. So I think getting beyond the fact that I've got to match exactly the color that I see is, uh, I think, difficult part. Once you overcome that and just concern yourself with creating a harmonious painting and giving the effect or the impression of what you're seeing, it works great. I want this video to improve your, the, your skills because I think I've put in as clear a way as I can the benefits of using a limited palette. So I would say that the great benefit is just, you need to just try it and work at it, it and you will see that it's well worth it. Try these colors together and mix them. I mentioned at the beginning how much time I'd spent when I discovered using limited palette, how much time I spent just mixing these colors together. It was like two weeks, hours and hours and hours every day just mixing color. And that's when the joy came in and I realized the possibilities of it. So I would encourage each of you students to do exactly the same thing. Mix the color and you'll learn and you'll see the benefits of it. I can teach it and I can tell you the benefits of it, but until you try it, and, and I've heard from many students that I've taught over the years that say, my goodness, I'm glad you taught me what you did. It's really helped me. And I know it will help everyone that watches this video also, if you try it. That guy could really paint. That's John Potoshnik and Limited Palette Landscapes. If you want to learn more about it, you can find it at lilyartvideo.com. Thanks for watching today. I'm Eric Rhodes. Great paintings seem to have a color harmony. Everything just works together. But how do painters create this harmony? Often, painters get themselves in trouble by having too many colors. Though you want paintings to look colorful, each color you add can throw your painting out of harmony. But one of the secrets to creating a sense of harmony and balance in your paintings is all about how you mix and work with the colors using a limited palette, meaning just three colors plus white. That's why if you take the time to learn the fundamentals of working in a limited palette, it can dramatically improve the quality of your paintings. In this all-new instructional DVD, John Potoshnik, one of the most talented landscape painters in the United States, will guide you through his entire step-by-step -step process for painting a beautiful country landscape scene using a limited palette. In limited palette landscapes, you'll discover how to select your subject and identify exactly what you want to portray on the canvas. John's secret to establishing value and working with dark and light accents to highlight the various points of interest. You'll also discover how to work with a muted palette that speaks softly and almost seduces your viewer into the painting. And how to paint all of the details of a beautiful two-story home in a country scene including the surrounding trees, the sky, foreground, background, and more. John Potoshnik is a highly technical master painter and an amazing teacher as well. Join him and discover how to take your painting skills to the next level. And of course, that's one of the benefits of using a limited palette because there's so few colors there, they have to be intermixed. If you didn't intermix, you would have one horrible looking painting. After implementing the limited palette in your paintings, you'll see your paintings come alive with balance and color harmony. Limited Palette Landscapes with John Potoshnik is now available on DVD and streaming video.